If you have your Bibles with you today, please open to 2 Corinthians. That's where we are as we work through Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. And uh, this week we are in chapter 11, and we'll look at the first 15 verses of chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11 begins, verse 1, by Paul saying this, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. So that's where we are today. I guess maybe we call this a foolish sermon. No, I don't think that would be appropriate. But what he means by that is this. This is his fourth letter we know that he wrote to the church at Corinth. We don't have the first one. We have the second one. We call it 1 Corinthians. And that was a, a rather difficult letter. He took them to task on a number of issues in 1 Corinthians. As you know, if you were here last year, we went through that book in, on Sunday mornings throughout the entire uh, last year. And the third letter we don't have, but he refers to that as his severe letter. He was really hard on them in that one, a difficult letter for him to write. And so now when we come to his fourth letter that we call 2 Corinthians, uh, his tone has changed. This letter is one of comfort, where he's really saying to them, okay, I've been hard on you, now it's time to comfort you. You've been hard on some people in discipline, now it's time to affirm your love for them, and let's get back to what this is really all about, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, instead of battling over all these issues. That's really what the heart of what this letter is all about. Yet, uh, there are still some things he has to deal with. And what he has to deal with are there are some folks that are teaching some things different than Paul. They are opposing Paul, they are talking negatively about him in this church, and as much as he'd like to just comfort these people, he still has to deal with these issues because he considered himself fully an apostle of Jesus Christ. So now he's getting into that part where he is doing some bragging on his apostleship, or so it could seem. And uh, so that's why he says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness when he begins this. He goes on to say, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, and you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully." There's the problem he identifies. The problem he's dealing with in this section is one of theological drift, that they are bearing with some teaching that is, is not kosher. And he starts out by saying, I'm jealous of you guys with a parental jealousy. Paul was the one that planted this church. He traveled to Corinth. There was no church there. He came, started preaching the gospel. Many received it. Pretty soon there was a church established. He stayed for a long time, a couple of years at Corinth. Then he went on to Ephesus, stayed even longer there. But he is the one who started this church, and as he puts it, he uses that idea that is a biblical concept of that betrothal, that our relationship with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is one of we are the bride of Christ, and we are awaiting the bridegroom and awaiting the, the festal wedding banquet that will come when he returns. And he uses that and says, I was the one that betrothed you to one husband. So I might present you a pure virgin. That's that jealousy. We think of jealousy as negative, right? Human jealousy is almost always negative. There is a godly jealousy. God says, I am a jealous God. I want you for myself. I don't want to share you with other gods. That's godly jealousy. That's a positive. And he said, this is the jealousy he has for these people, that uh, he has a, a definite parental affection for them. And so these things cause him a great deal of concern. And so he brings them up and he says, bear with me with a little foolishness for a while. We got to talk about this stuff. He also talks about the craftiness of the enemy. Verse three, I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve in his craftiness, your minds may be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Uh, he is very aware of the enemy. Paul's the one that talks a lot about spiritual warfare. In this letter, in chapter 2, verse 11, he says, So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. That's we talked about that last week when he brought up the idea of that spiritual warfare. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. And there is an enemy out there. And to be a follower of Christ is to be at war spiritually. And our enemy does not come disguised as a nasty person. 
he comes disguised as truth. His methods, as we know from the very beginning, Paul said, we're not ignorant of his schemes. From the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't flat out bold lies. It was deflective lies that had some truth in them. No, God said to you, you'll die if you eat that fruit. You won't die. In other words, you won't drop dead. It won't kill you. And of course, it didn't immediately. The truth of it was, yes, it did kill them spiritually and begin them on the road to death, so it did kill them. But it was, a, it was a tricky little lie. And the other thing he said was, he doesn't want you to eat that fruit because you'll be like him, and he doesn't want that. Well, that was actually true, sort of. For after they did eat, he put them out of the garden, saying, now they become like us, knowing good from evil. If they get back to that tree of life, they'll stay that way forever. They were out of the garden, and cherubim were guarding with a flaming sword for them getting back into that garden. So those half lies that deflect the truth are what the enemy uses, and he's warning them about this here, saying, uh, what concerns me is the same thing that concerns me with Satan in the Garden of Eden with Eve, that, uh, that subtle deflection that is, seems like true, is maybe partly true, but ultimately is not at all true. And then he gets down to business in verse 4. For when one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom you have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. You let them do that. You let them stay and teach those things. That's his real concern. Now, by the way, this is not a concern just that somebody else is teaching them and taking precedence. That's not what he's worried about. When he was in Ephesus, he sent people there to take care of them that way. Apollos came from Ephesus to be their teacher, so they have some good teaching. But what they have here apparently in Corinth is some preachers who are not proclaiming the same Jesus, not proclaiming the same spirit, not proclaiming the same gospel. And by the way, this has not changed in 2,000 years. If anything, it's magnified. You talk about bearing these things beautifully. The church, quote unquote today, bears anything under the sun quite beautifully. Go on Google sometime and any spiritual concept, see what comes up when you, when you hit a, a Google search on that. You'll find everything under the sun. And it is bared beautifully. So another Jesus is still another problem. Another Jesus means that maybe some say Jesus is just a good teacher, that he was just a prophet, or that he was anything less than God. He says, you guys bear that beautifully. That's another Jesus. That's not the Jesus we know. By the way, that's what marks cults as different. That's how we, we can identify things as cults. Why do we consider Jehovah's Witness a cult? They have some truth. You know, some of their teaching is pretty good. You listen to some of their stuff, read some of their stuff, a lot of it, you say, yeah, right on the button. When it comes to the person of Jesus, they are very, very wrong. And that makes everything wrong. He is not God. He is something less than God. He is a God, small g, perhaps. But that's how we identify those things. That's how we identify cults. What do you say about Jesus? Jesus, a question to his disciples, what do people say that I am? And they answered, some say a prophet, some say Elijah, John the Baptist, come back. And he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter hit it right on the button. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that was a point where Jesus' ministry changed with his disciples. At that point, he started teaching them directly of what, who he was and what he was going to do. So another Jesus, a problem today, another spirit. That can be a problem today. Some of the hyper-Pentecostal factions come to the point where it's another spirit. It's not the same Holy Spirit that we know. It's a different spirit. Some say another gospel. What's another gospel? Anything added to faith in Jesus Christ is another gospel. There's other gospels all over our world today. And there were at this time too. And this is what he says. There's some people there that are, are really close, but they're deflecting that truth about Jesus. They're deflecting that truth of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They're deflecting, really, the gospel when they do that. Go back with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians, that letter we looked at last year, chapter 15. That's only a few pages back in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And beginning with verse 1, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that, Jesus, or that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So here's the gospel. It's about Jesus Christ. Which Jesus Christ? The Jesus Christ that died for your sins on the cross according to Scripture. One of the heresies of our day, by the way, is that he didn't die as a uh, propitiatory sacrifice. He didn't die as a payment for sin. That's, that's divine child abuse. He died as an example of how we should be devoted to one another and give our lives to one another. No, that's not what the Scripture says. The scripture says he bore our sin and the wages of sin is death and the death had to be paid because God is a just God that demands justice. And that justice was Jesus Christ representing us in his death and his shed blood. That's why the emphasis is on the blood of Christ for our salvation. He died for our sins. That's according to scripture. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, just like the scripture said. And it's historic. It's not mythological. Another myth of our times is that it is mythological. But, you know, it, it's mythology, but the principles are so good that we believe it. That's many churches teach that. That is a different gospel. Paul makes it very clear what he's talking about here. He says, this is really the problem. Theological drift. You are bearing with all this other stuff that these teachers are teaching instead of calling it what it is. Wrong. Another Jesus. It's another spirit. It's another gospel. So that is his concern for them. And in our world today, obviously, uh, much the same concerns are there. So what's at stake? What's at stake is nothing less than the truth. As we go on in this passage, he identifies himself and, in fact, as he says, boasts of his apostleship. Verse 5, for I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. But even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way we have made this evident to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin by humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel to you without charge? I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. But when I was present with you, and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything I kept myself uh, from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. The truth is, is, excuse me, the truth of Christ is in me. This boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. He's defending his apostleship here. Paul had a very strong sense of his apostleship. His detractors were saying, wait a minute, he's not one of the twelve. Who does he think he is? Well, Paul was a unique apostle. By the way, the word apostle means sent one, one sent from God. He was most certainly that. His conversion was unique on that road to Damascus. He met Jesus Christ face to face, was knocked flat on the ground, could not see until he went to Damascus and met the person God had appointed who proclaimed the gospel to him and the scales fell off his eyes. He went away for Arabia for a period of time of probably a few years. What did he do there? We're not told. But we know what, what he insinuates in his writings was he met with Jesus in a very unique and special way. The Lord touched him in a very, very, not a normal way, a very special way. In fact, when we get to the, a passage down the road a week or two uh, that we'll look at in 2 Corinthians, he talks about his visit to the third heaven. Very interesting. Not a place many human beings go. Lord Jesus met Paul in a unique way, and he knew it, and he knew his calling. He was a sent one to the Gentiles, and he took that very seriously. What was at stake was the truth, because the apostles were the teachers of the early church. They did not have the New Testament. What they had was, they had the apostles. And those apostles were the teachers, and they were to take the apostles' teaching as the word of God. That's why when the apostles' words were recorded, and these things we call scripture came around, they recognized them as scripture. And the church, in, in uh, figuring out which of these writings were actually should be scripture, and which were just good writings, and some even heretical writings, they looked back to that, did it come from the apostles or the apostolic circle? 
That was one of their firm requirements for that because that was the word of God. That's how God taught in those days. Paul understood this. And so when they're not believing him, that's an issue of truth that equates itself with scripture. And yes, it sounds like boasting, but he says, you know what? This boasting has to go on because this is truth. And he had a good sense of that. We know from this he was not the best orator in the world. He wasn't the best public speaker. He didn't give the most flowery sermons. And some of these imposters evidently did. And so they figured, well, since he gives better sermons, he must be right. But Paul says, you may not like the way I speak, but can you argue with my knowledge? Look at the letters he wrote. We're looking at them today. Can we argue with that knowledge? Uh, his apostleship was extremely important. It's the basis of the New Testament. There's a reason why Paul wrote a good chunk of our New Testament. Because God was speaking in and through him. And I think it's interesting that he wasn't very impressive in person. That's one of the things they had against him. In person, he was unimpressive, but in his writings, wow. You go, why is that? Well, maybe it have something to do with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We believe the writers of Scripture were inspired. A classic example of inspiration is the Apostle Paul, who when he wrote letters that are supposed to be in Scripture, they were astounding. And these churches read them and said, wow, we've got to save this and pass it on. And they recognized this Scripture. In person, eh, not so much. By the way, do not uh, fall prey to uh, idolizing human beings, no matter how good they may be at speaking or presenting truth. Analyze the truth that they speak. That's a good lesson for all of us. Don't be caught into the, uh, the cult of personality like so many are today. Where because someone just is so much fun to listen to, you want to believe that everything they say is true. Examine what, what they do say. By the way, here's something interesting you may not know about. Many of you do. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. That's what, towards the end. 2 Peter chapter 3. And look what Peter says about Paul there. 2 Peter chapter 3 beginning with verse 14, the end of Peter's second letter. Now, Peter was martyred, just like Paul was, and he, he didn't live much longer than Paul did, so this is very contemporary, what he's writing. This is something not written 20 years down the road. Okay, This is something written in, in contemporary times. Here's what he says about Paul, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look at these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand. Now, a preacher of, of the, the word of God that's been going through the letters of Paul, I can affirm to you some of these things are not easy to understand. But at any rate, Peter caught that as well. Some of these things are hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort, as they also do the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. Did you catch that? Peter, writing at a contemporary time, not years down the road, when Paul was still around and doing that, says, now, uh, just like Paul writes, and some of his things are, un are tough to understand, and those who are unstable distort them like they do the rest of Scripture. It's very clear in the Greek. He's equating Paul's writing even then with Scripture. These people realized in the apostolic circle, as it was going around, that this stuff was Scripture that he was writing. Isn't that interesting? They had a handle on the inspiration there. And so this is what Paul is doing in this passage we're looking at now in 2 Corinthians. He's depending defending his apostleship because it's a matter of truth. If they don't believe he's an apostle, they're not going to believe what he says. They're not going to believe the word of God. That's what it comes down to. And uh, so he gives this, uh, <laughs> this very interesting uh, defense and, and saying, you know what, this, if this is boasting, it's going to keep on because it has to. I, I don't do it because I don't love you. I do it because I love you. He had a good grip on his apostleship. So, the problem here is theological drift, and what was at stake? Nothing less than truth. So here's where we come down to our solution. The last few verses are beginning with verse 12. But what I am doing I will continue to do, so that I may, be, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the manners about which we are boasting. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 
Therefore, it is not surprising that if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. The solution is discernment. There were some others who were claiming apostolic authority in their teaching. He says they are false apostles. They are false teachers. They are workers of deception. They disguise themselves as apostles, disguise themselves as workers of righteousness. By the way, false teachers in our world today, and they're out there, you know them by what they teach. False teachers are not evil people that are like dishonest John going, yeah, uh -uh, I'm going to deceive. They are people that sincerely think they've got the truth, but they've been deluded by the enemy. And they can be the most persuasive, most powerful, most charismatic, most authoritative. In fact, I'd be aware of the most authoritative preachers. Every preacher of the word of God should have a good dose of humility. That should be a prerequisite for that. But he says, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting. So how do we know if Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, how do we know? We know by discerning what is being spoken. Hold it up to the searchlight of Scripture, to the standard of the gospel. First of all, I'll say this. If you're following a preacher and is, is really hung up on angels, beware. That's a warning sign. Angels are not that important in Scripture. They're servants. They're the butlers and maids. They're not the important ones. Some people get hung up on angels. Beware. That's, just, that's a red flag. Okay? By the way, that's how Islam started. It started with a visitation of an angel. And I believe Muhammad had a real visitation, had a real encounter. I don't think that was a, a fairy tale. I think he had a real supernatural encounter. And if you study the history of it, what's interesting, he didn't know what to make of that. He was talking to a Christian who, when hearing what he said, told him, oh, that sounds like the angel Gabriel. And thus it goes down. A Christian gave him that idea. A Christian, by the way, who was not very discerning, if he was a discerning Christian, he would have listened to what Muhammad heard from the angel and said, that's not an angel of light. Just something to think about. Now that that's over the airwaves, I hope I'm not in trouble for even talking like this. Uh, <laughs> but his people are disguised as servants of righteousness. They seem really good. They seem, and the teaching is so authoritative and just sounds so good. And, uh, well, you know what I'm talking about. So how do we know? Here's the question. How do we discern? How do we do that? We have an enemy who disguises himself as truth. Let's go back, if you would, to verse 3 of this passage. It says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. There is a clue for us. Simplicity. The gospel is simple. Go back to that 1 Corinthians 15 passage we looked at. It's simple. It's Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose again, historically, according to scripture. That's the basis of our gospel. When you start complicating it with other things, it's believing in Jesus Christ plus living the right way. It's believing in Jesus Christ plus having the right name for God. It's believing in Jesus Christ and having the right day for the Sabbath. It's believing in Jesus Christ plus having the right uh, translation of scripture. All those things are additions and complications to the gospel and stand back and let the red flags go up. When people start, and by the way, when you get hung up on those things, the kingdom of God gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and the true believers are me and Jeff, and I wonder sometimes about Jeff. <laughs> right? Beware of teachers that have a very small kingdom of God, and they're the ones lead elect, and the whole rest of the church has been deceived. Well, you know what? The Holy Spirit of God is a little better than that. Now, granted, I don't believe everyone's going to be in glory that thinks they're going to be in glory, but at any rate, simplicity is the first one. Purity. Just as those that preach a complicated gospel narrow down the kingdom, those that allow immorality expand the kingdom. If you believe in Jesus Christ, it really doesn't matter how you live. God understands, and people are people, and it's all grace. No, there's a purity to the gospel. There's a morality that cannot be denied. Our God is a moral God, and he has got standards that are far more severe than our worldly standards today. So 
Beware if it expands the gospel to include uh, moral indiscretions that are really okay with our Lord. Never. From beginning to end of this word, they are never okay. And the last thing there, it is all about Jesus. It's about Jesus. If you are sitting under preaching or teaching of someone who does the Bible a lot but not so much about Jesus, red flags go up. That's the warning. It's about Jesus according to Scripture, as we already talked about. It is the simplicity of faith in Jesus Christ alone. Now, granted, a faith that that results in an acceptance, in a new birth, and a purity that is a lifestyle that is opposed to the immorality of our world. Those are just some of the things that I think we get out of this passage. How do we discern? We look at those things. By the way, the final word in this, be people of the book. Be people that read and study. Make this a part of your regular day. We have some guides in the back for daily Bible reading. Take one of those. If you are not in habit, get started reading the scriptures. Get involved with fellowships where you can study with other people. Studying all by yourself or in a very small group, that's a nice way of kind of, you can start drifting without knowing it. The more people around, the more people to bounce off with, being in Bible studies where you discuss things and can ask questions, that's how we learn. That's how we discern. That's how we help one another with that. And by the way, if you're sitting under teaching that does not like to be corrected and you cannot raise an objection and get an audience, that's a red flag as well. I hope and pray that as you listen to what I say, that you examine everything I say according to the word of God. And if you might find something that is not quite right, please tell me. For the sake of Christ, please tell me. I promise I'll receive it. I have some of you that that do that, and I appreciate that. Not that you're critics, but you are concerned. If something, you have a question, you, you bring it to me, and that's awesome. That's good. Because this is the challenge that Paul lays out there. It's an issue of truth. Theological drift is all over the Christian church today. And we need to be people of discernment who study the scriptures, who know the scriptures that are in tune to the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus Christ. Let's pray.